Chamber of Blood, the Red Crane, Veil of Blood, too. Saku looked beyond the pistol, to a man in a dark kimono and short black hair. He inched closer to her with a smile, but she did not move nor give him the satisfaction of flinching. She met his gaze and edged back slightly. Then she stared off in the distance, where she could see shadows moving about a cluster of abandoned homes near the wharf. The small village had been abandoned, no doubt, due to its proximity to the woods and the creatures that lurked within the mist. The man cleared his throat and placed the barrel inches from her face. Saku stared into his eyes without fear or concern. She looked down at his sandals and back to his eyes. Move, he ordered, his ignorant smile widening. I know who... A sudden flash of moonlight, and his head toppled off his shoulders before he could finish his sentence. Saku watched the headless body spray warm blood into the cool night as it jerked left and right and finally collapsed into a mound of shells and seaweed, startling a nervous crab that instantly scuttled away into the gloom of the night. Saku gripped her sword and patiently picked her way through the jagged rock formations to reach the small village where black serpent brutes guarded the area against anyone who might try to interfere with their dark rituals and secret trade negotiations. She moved silently through the shadows, following the edge of a home. She froze when she heard footsteps approaching. She slowly placed her back against the wall and waited. She peeked around the corner and saw two thugs telling stories about the demon samurai. She crouched slightly. Then, like a mighty tigress, she leaped into the air and thrust her sword through the two heads. They jerked violently, then collapsed when she pulled her sword from their skulls. She took a moment to survey the area, then made her way noiselessly to the wharf, where three thugs laughed and made jokes about the strange red alcohol the foreigners had shared with them. She held her sword firm and she started toward them, practically gliding with quick, smooth steps. Just as one brute turned to meet her focused gaze, she lunged with blinding speed and... Three headless bodies suddenly staggered stupidly in the dark and collapsed into each other, with arterial blood spraying darkness against the bright light of the moon. Wiping warm blood off her face, she climbed a series of crates, moved past a clump of fishing nets, and crouched by the gangplank. She listened carefully for movement, and heard steps just above in the ship. When the footsteps receded to silence, she moved stealthily up the gangplank and halted, scanning the ship, spotting one thug sitting cross-legged on a crate. Beside him were several other crates bearing the VOC logo and name of the Dutch East India Company. Carefully, Saku embarked on the ship and moved toward the brute. But just as she prepared to pounce, she heard a click, followed by a high-pitched wheeling sound. It took her less than a moment to understand she had been lured into a trap, less than a moment too late. Before Saku had time to react, she felt the heaviness of a net collapse over her as dozens of thugs surrounded her with dirty looks and curses. She then watched the sitting thug, the leader of the group, turn to face her. The leader smiled, stood briskly, and laughed. We thought you might show up, he said as he approached her. He made a quick wave with his hand and the thugs instantly trained musket pistols on her. You've been quite busy interfering with our good work. She didn't respond, but she pushed and pulled against the net to gauge its strength. She glared at him as she realized this was no chance ambush. The Black Serpent Society had been tracking her and had somehow managed to trap her. The leader shook his head at her. Your clan is destroyed. Your weapon is irrelevant and outdated. You're outnumbered and trapped. And still you think you can do the impossible. This will be difficult, she thought. But not impossible. I've been in worse situations and survived. Saku inched closer to the leader as he smiled at her. She believed his reluctance to shoot her was evidence that they wanted her alive for one of their rituals. The leader motioned to all the thugs and laughed again. Saku gritted her teeth, 
and studied the thugs as they slowly closed in on her from every direction. She looked into the leader's thieving dark eyes and saw all the lies and treachery of the Black Serpent Society. Then looking beyond his eyes, she visualized herself triumphing against her enemy, leaping from thug to thug, cutting them down with her sword like weeds. Suddenly the leader barked orders, snapping her back to reality. The thugs inched closer to her with hideous smiles and wide, nervous eyes. Surrender willingly, the leader said flatly, and we will reunite you with your clan, as misguided as they may have been. Saku understood his meaning. He believed their rituals would open a doorway into the nameless realm, where they were supposedly trapped and cursed to live out an endless cycle of life and death for reasons beyond comprehension. Saku didn't know what to believe. What she did know was that she wouldn't allow these thugs the satisfaction of serving her on a sacrificial platter to the darkness they served and she had promised to destroy. She had made an oath long ago as a member of the Red Crown Clan to cleanse the world of the reeking corruption that was the Black Serpent Society, and she planned to honor that oath. With the strength and power of her ancestors coursing through her veins, Saku instantly rushed forward, her hand thrusting through the net. Powerful fingers grabbed the leader by the scruff of his kimono and pulled him in. Then, using him as a human shield, she whirled as pistols fired and balls ripped through his belly, chest, and skull. Through the rising smoke from the pistols, Saku could see the thugs trying to reload. Without a moment to lose, she tossed her busted and shredded shield to the ground, and with difficulty, she sliced through the net with her sword. A moment later, she was a hurricane of death and destruction, leaping from thug to thug as her hissing blade painted the deck red. The thugs didn't know what to do. They were too stunned to react. It was like fighting a ghost, a monstrous shadow, a formless mist with swords for claws. Their futile attempts to parry her attacks with pistols met empty air as limbs fell and heads rolled. It was a horrible nightmare, as if by some strange ironic twist of fate, the Red Crane actually drew her power from the Black Mist Serpent, so that she was somehow a servant of the very darkness she had sworn to eliminate. When the last thug fell with a gasp, Saku found herself surrounded by blood and carnage. She took in the stench of gunpowder as her gaze slowly lowered to a thug, groveling like a maggot. She had sliced his legs at the knees, and he was crawling away with nervous elbows that slipped with every move in the growing pool of blood. Wiping the gore off her face and kimono, she blocked his path and crouched to face him. The thug looked at her with widening eyes. A bleat of terror rose from his throat that rose to a shrill pitch as she raised her sword and ended his service to the Black Serpent Society. Saku rose slowly, and searching the ship, spotted a cluster of oil lamps glowing and flickering atop a crate. With focused determination, she picked her way through the bodies and kicked the crate, sending the oil lamps scattering to the wooden deck below. The lamps spat liquid fire and set the deck and lifeboat ablaze. Then walking away from the burning ship, Saku considered everything she had just experienced. Trapped. How did they know she was coming for them? How could she have taken the bait? How had she been lured so easily? Enough. Warriors do not waste time with what-ifs and what they should have or could have done. What matters now is the present and taking the next right step. Where to now? She couldn't think straight. Despite all her training, a flame of anger burst in Saku for her careless mistake. Yet she repressed her frustration and knew there was no use for it. Anger would only cloud her judgment and waste her time. She needed to keep her composure because... Her friends and family could not have perished in vain. Because she was the last of her clan. Because the Black Serpent Society had to be stopped because she was the hope of all those who believed she would end the darkness that was upon their land. Because she was... 
The Red Crane. Arcus, 41. The mad designer sketches are preposterous, yet entertaining. I just went through hundreds of sketches of monsters and killers in tuxedos and golfing attire. Makes no sense. And yet I found myself pinning these absurd illustrations in my study. They have absolutely no value to my investigation. Yet they made me smile, even laugh. And perhaps that's enough. Perhaps helping me forget the horrors of this place, even for just a moment, turns the absurdity of these designs into a kind of medicine. As much as I take offense to the complete disregard the mad designer has for these characters, I can't help but search the Chamber of Blood for more Emperor Dwight illustrations. They are, so far, my favorite. Arcus, 8542. The creatures move around the fog, watching me without attacking. They're waiting for the perfect moment, which will never come, for I have barricaded every door and window and practiced savage and efficient combat maneuvers with my nine iron. I've caught glimpses of their forms, and they are ever-changing, as though imitating all the monsters I've read about in my favorite stories. As though the fog itself were an extension of my dark imagination and fears. I'm calling these horrible things creatures of the fog. Chamber of Blood, Deja Vuism. It was a book club, and they were arguing over the latest Edwin Kane novel, along with the interview the author had given, where he discussed a concept he had called Deja Vuism. He put forward the theory that our brains are biological quantum computers with vast networking abilities beyond our current understanding of physics. Kane believed that our quantum brains could connect to other beings with similar frequencies within the multiverse, as though they were interdimensional cell phones. The club members who discussed these theories and how they sometimes felt their inner voice was another version of themselves, advising them from another time or place, began telling stories about instincts, gut feelings, and deja vu experiences that felt all too real. There was one skeptic who scoffed at the idea of the multiverse. He thought the idea was ridiculous comic book nonsense, and he laughed at the very notion that our brains were interconnected multidimensional computers that received or projected ideas from the ether. One woman exclaimed, It could be true. Such a theory would help us understand why ideas seem to come to us as a group, or why so many similar ideas seem to bubble up all over the world at pretty much the same time. Who's to say we aren't all tapping into the same stream of ideas? The skeptic answered, It's just coincidence. That's all it is when a bunch of people from different places come up with similar ideas. And coincidence has nothing to do with the multiverse or other versions of ourselves in the universe. Another man shook his head and said, I don't really agree. There's shit out there we just don't understand. And I recently read the idea for Wi-Fi and cell phones came from a bunch of scientists trying to understand a gland in our brain. A gland that's bioluminescent and seems to be searching for signals. Granted, this could be online misinformation, but what is true, and what many cultures believe, is that our artists can tap into things not of this world. What I found interesting was how Kane said these visions that artists receive are only accessible to those who experience trauma when they're young. Those who have been bullied, abused, exiled. Those who have learned to shut out their reality for self-protection in order to fully experience other realities. A woman added, The door to the physical world closes. The door to another world opens. The skeptic laughed and was just about to speak when another woman, an aspiring storyteller, interrupted him and said, I get visions and dreams about the same place all the time. One of my recurring dreams is of Romulus, and how he is taken up by a massive black storm cloud and brought to this dark realm where he's chased by a hideous creature, a monster that could not possibly exist. What's strange is he's not alone. He's not the only being hunted. He's with a biker and two other Scottish men who at first I thought were sailors. But then I had this other dream that showed me that they were, in fact, lighthouse keepers. 
I did some research and I could swear by the pictures that the biker I was seeing was Yui Kimura, the one who disappeared a few years ago. The skeptic laughed and said, So what you're saying is the Emperor of Rome wasn't assassinated by his generals, but is somehow stuck in some kind of demented world with Yuri Kimura and two lighthouse keepers. This, you somehow believe, is real. Romulus and Yui are running from a monster as we sip coffee and tea in our cozy chairs and talk books and authors. This is what you're putting forward as something possible? Something reasonable for all of us to believe? A woman said, It sounds a bit out there, but maybe there are things in the cosmos that are beyond reason or science. Another woman beamed at the aspiring storyteller and said, Real or not, you should write a story for your blog or even for your next performance. I think it would be a lot of fun, even if it does require a little suspension of disbelief. The aspiring storyteller smiled and answered, Actually, I have a draft I've been working on which I wanted to share with the group before I posted it. I'm still not sure if it's a story I can perform because it's a bit complicated and messy, but maybe you can help me find ways to energize and simplify it. Everyone nodded enthusiastically, except for the skeptic who rolled his eyes. The storyteller pulled out a coffee-stained notebook and opened it to a story that she still had entitled. She took a deep, calming breath and began... This story doesn't have a title, but I'm thinking of calling it The Tragedy of Cliff and Alex, who were real people and who disappeared before most of us were born. Now, I'm not one to believe in conspiracy theories or urban legends, but their story, which I acquired through extensive interviews and research, opened my mind to the possibility that there is more to our lives than that which can be seen or proven. The skeptic quipped, Well, that's convenient, isn't it? The storyteller ignored his comment and continued. Love, for example, exists and ceases to exist just as soon as we indulge in proofs and evidence. As soon as there is doubt, as soon as there is a need for proof, love is dead. And yet we know love is real. And we know, don't we, that love is quite unreasonable. It's powerful. It's maddening. And we hate that we can't define it. Love exists, and it doesn't need to be proven in any way, shape, or form for it to be real. The storyteller made an exaggerated gesture to grab something in the empty air. And yet, just as soon as you try to grasp it, it tatters at the touch. Cliff Barra always loved horror movies. He started making scary movies when his father bought him his first Super 8 camera. And so it comes to no surprise that he grew up to be a famous director who translated his favorite gothic novels and horror stories to the silver screen. It's also no surprise that when he met Alex DeMauro, an equally famous art director known for his brilliant and visionary production sets and costume designs, that they were instantly smitten with one another. Together, it's safe to say, they produced some of the scariest and most iconic films to date. But all this changed when Alex suddenly disappeared while on set, in a rolling cloud of black fog the crew insisted they had not designed. From that point on, the movie stopped. A great heaviness came over Cliff as he found himself confronted by the horror that he would never see Alex again. He turned his back on his friends, his career, his life and he became possessed by an obsession to find out what had happened to Alex. Investigations into this strange fog led him to a group of people searching for missing loved ones. With this group, he learned about the existence of secret cults and societies that understood the black fog and the strange realm from which it came. He dug deeper and deeper. Discovering his old movie set wasn't haunted as everyone said it was, but was a kind of doorway to another realm. So he returned to the haunted movie set where Alex disappeared and waited and waited. He waited for days until finally he heard Alex's laughter and with the laughter came the fog and the fog rolled in and carried him away. 
And so Cliff ended up in another world that defied his wildest nightmares. He followed Alex's voice through a darkness that had never known the light of day. At last, he came upon a forest of wooden stakes bearing skewered heads. He picked his way through the stakes, inspecting each head. The scene reminded him of one of the first films he had made as a teenager. He soon came to one head that resembled an old producer friend of his. Suddenly the eyes sprang open and Cliff started. At once all the heads came alive, taunting and ridiculing him like he had been ridiculed as a child for his passions and hobbies. But Cliff stayed the course despite the insults and the taunts that he would never see Alex again. One head of the thousands shouted louder than the rest. The head screamed that Alex was being corrupted and that he should turn back before it was too late. Realizing this severed head knew more than the rest, Cliff kicked the stake and caught the head as it toppled off. The head protested and yelled that it had once been a king and it didn't want to be in the hands of a commoner. And Cliff promised the king he would release him after, and only after, he helped him find Alex. Long story short, the head led Cliff to the edge of a massive gate that surrounded a town that resembled every production set Alex had ever designed for Cliff. Before he could take in the area, he suddenly heard Alex screaming in the distance. The king warned Cliff not to interfere with the process and explained that Alex was being twisted and tortured into a brutal murdering monster for reasons they would never understand. But Cliff couldn't bear to hear Alex suffer. Every agonizing scream was a dagger in his heart, and so, dropping the head, he climbed over the gate, and unperturbed by the formless creatures moving in the fog, he followed the cries to the top of the castle he recognized from his Frankenstein film. Cliff charged up the winding stairs to the roof, where he found Alex, agonizing on a metal table as bolts of lightning struck him every few moments from a thick, black storm cloud. All around him in glass prisons, filled with formaldehyde, were all the monsters Alex had ever designed since he was a child. Cliff couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was as if this living nightmare were all a projection of their combined memories. Cliff didn't even try to understand what was happening or what he was experiencing. Without hesitation, he rushed up to Alex, not knowing what to do. In the shadows, he spotted an axe on the cobblestone floor and instantly grabbed it. Then, despite the deadly lightning, he pushed through the sizzling and sparking pain to smash the chains that bound Alex to the table. Alex opened his half-conscious eyes with difficulty. He barely recognized Cliff. Alex squinted with charred eyelids and managed to murmur words that made Cliff smile. Then Cliff hefted Alex over his shoulders and charged down the stairs and out into the thickening fog, where frantic, formless creatures did all they could to prevent them from escaping. Cliff kicked, punched, and charged through the fog, smashing through creatures, crows, and claws, everything and anything the world set against him. He remembered the king telling him something about a hatch. The hatch would somehow lead to freedom. Desperately, Cliff searched the ground as he heard a roar followed by a clap of thunder. Pounding steps chased him through the darkness. He didn't even bother to look back. He rushed forward until he saw it, the glint of metal by a crumbling gargoyle statue from one of his movies. He ran to the hatch, opened it, and lowered Alex to safety. Then, just as he was about to descend, something sharp like talons clutched his ankles and pulled him screaming into the raging fog. I'd like to say that it all worked out in the end, and that they lived happily ever after. But that's not the truth of this story. The truth is, Cliff took Alex's place at the torturer's table, and was turned into a perfect champion of horror with little or no memory of who he was, or how he ended up in this dark realm. And Alex, well, he ended up with a group of stranded souls who did whatever they could just to survive. But that's another story for another time. Suffice to say that love torments all, bringing the best and worst out of us when we least expect it. The storyteller finished.
and everyone was silent and inward, thinking about what they had sacrificed for love, and what they would sacrifice for love. But not the skeptic. No, the skeptic was turning the story over and over in his head, searching for issues. At last, he broke the silence, asking, What happened to the head? The talking head? Cliff just drops the king's head and then you never hear about it again. It kind of makes the story incomplete. A woman blurted out, Who cares about the damn head? It's a love story. The skeptic added, Also, I don't think you can use tatters as a verb. The storyteller smiled and politely said, I'm still working the story, and the ideas are still coming to me in my dreams. I've been logging them in my notebooks, and I'll reread the current version more critically to see if I need to do something else with the talking head. Another woman said, All that horror and for what? To end up twisted and tortured and turned into some abomination worse than anything he ever filmed? I feel so bad for him. A man said, I don't. Not because I don't like him as a character, but because that's just the kind of things we do for love. The horrible and the beautiful. The bitter and the sweet. The euphoria and the madness. He lost himself in a memory for a moment. Love twists and torments. And I'm sure there's nothing that dark world can do to anyone that would surpass the torment of not knowing what had happened to a loved one. Or worse, the regret of knowing what had happened and not doing anything. Another man said, Well, I do hope you publish this story on your blog. I found it heartbreaking and terrifying. And I guess I'm wondering if you really think this is what happened to the real Cliff and Alex. The storyteller shrugged and closed her notebook as she prepared to leave. She wasn't sure what she believed anymore. The skeptic laughed and said, I'll tell you what I think. I think the real Cliff and Alex faked their disappearance to get out of the limelight, and they moved far, far away to some gorgeous exotic island where they're eating grapes, drinking margaritas, and living happily ever after. The man said, well, I do hope you're right, and the story is just a story. But if you're not, well, I hope Alex will one day be able to do for Cliff what Cliff did for him. A woman said, It kind of makes you wonder if the characters we read about in the books are actually real somewhere. Another woman said, A story in this world, reality in another. The storyteller stood smiled at all the book club members and excused herself as she had an early shift at the cafe. Everyone said goodbye, watched her disappear out the door, and then returned to their discussion about Edwin Kane, deja vuism, and the story they had just heard.